excuse me. Uh, somebody asked about oxidizing agent versus reducing agent and those kind of topics being on the on the test they weren't on the practice test at all right um it's another one that I, it will basically show up as a as an addition to the um to the reaction section it might be something like um for extra credit you know label all the oxidizing agents and reducing agents in any redox reactions out of the, the three stoichiometry questions. I won't tell you which ones are redox reactions, but you get a point or two of extra credit on each of you can label um, the oxidizing agent, reducing agent. So I still want you paying attention to those concepts, but as far as like prioritizing, it's way more important that you get the hang of stoichiometry and balancing reactions and determining polar molecules. That stuff's all way more important than can you use the word oxidizing agent properly. So that's why I don't tend to focus on that on the class S. Brendan, can we just go uh, get some kind of way over kind of that? Yeah, so after break today, it'll all be um, review. Okay. And we should, at least we should be mostly review anyway. And that'll be a perfect time to talk about that. Okay. Um, and just a note now that uh, the recording is going and most everybody's here. Um, next week, we only officially meet for the test on Thursday. Which and double check the time it might be noon to two rather than one to three. Um, so double check that it's on the syllabus, um, and I'll I'll check it on at break if I remember to do so to remind everybody. But that's our only officially scheduled meeting time next week. I still have all my regularly scheduled office hours, so that's Monday, Wednesday, nine to ten thirty, or Tuesday, Thursday, three to four in the afternoon. Um, in any of the lab times, we would normally be meeting for labs. I might not be in my office, but if you arrange with me ahead of time, I'm more than willing to meet with you. I will probably be on campus for most of that time. Um, but since it's not scheduled meeting time, let me know ahead of time so I know to, to make myself available um, and make sure I'm not you know, doing something like, like taking the kids to the doctor or something like that. Um, so just uh, if you want to meet during at any point next week, just shoot me an email. Um, and the best times are usually the times that you're already would normally be scheduled to meet. Sound reasonable? Um, feel free to arrange study groups. If, if there's a group of five of you that want to study some certain time next week, and um, you know, I think it would be helpful for me to drop in and answer some questions, let me know what time you're going to meet. If I can make it, I'll see what I can do. Um, and I can and help out that way, or shoot me an email um, with your questions. Okay. All right. Um, the other random question here, somebody asked about neurotransmitters since we talked about consciousness last time. Um, and neurotransmitters is one of those things that I keep referring to neurologies in its infancy. We don't really know anything about how consciousness works or memory works and that kind of thing. Um, that said, we do know that there are certain molecules in the brain that are correlated with certain properties. We can't really say that they cause things necessarily because all of these systems wind up being intertwined and there's a lot more to it. Um, but we can say things like serotonin, low serotonin levels is correlated with depression. We don't know that low serotonin levels cause depression. And if we, if we use selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors to increase serotonin levels that has a positive effect on depression symptoms. But the mechanism is not as simple as more serotonin equals less depressed because it turns out that there's um, those select those SSRIs, um, they elevate serotonin levels immediately, but that depression symptoms don't lessen for about two to three weeks after you start taking them. So it's like there's something more complicated going on with a lot of these. And so I want to, I just want to make clear that I'm going to show you a figure about certain about neurotransmitters. It's way oversimplified. Um, but it's kind of cool and kind of piques the interest and kind of lets you know what's kind of going on research-wise in neurology and, and yeah. uh, neuroscience. Um, let's see. So we're gonna play. So here's an example of a couple 
molecules that are referred to as neurotransmitters. And neurotransmitters just means, okay, they're what are called chemical messengers. They allow different cells and different parts of your body to communicate uh, with each other by basically increasing or decreasing concentrations of these molecules. Um, and so some of them have familiar names like adrenaline, or which is also known as um, epinephrine, is the same thing as adrenaline. Um, noradrenaline and norepinephrine are the same thing. But they're basically these fairly small molecules that by most all of the different moods and emotions and memory are tied to one or more, more, more of these various neurotransmitters. Probably the simplest one, the easiest to understand is dopamine because that's basically used as a way to reinforce behavior internally. When you do something good, good, something that um, improves your body's fitness or something that um, you accomplish a task, your body releases dopamine and that's basically like, a, hey, good job. It's like giving a dog a treat when you're training a dog. When it, when it does the behavior that you want it to do, you give it a treat. It's the same thing that dopamine does in our brain. Anytime you do something repetitive that that is fun, it's because it's releasing dopamine and you're training yourself to like doing that more by doing it. But then again, it's also really similar in shape, in structure to the adrenaline and noradrenaline. So if you've ever noticed when you finish something, finish a big project and you get that, that you know, whiff of relief at the very end, you might actually notice your heart rate elevates a little bit. That's because by changing dopamine levels in your brain, it actually changes adrenaline levels in your brain too. That's why some people really like thrill seeking and you know adrenaline junkies. Um, it has a similar effect. If you do something that releases a ton of adrenaline, it also affects dopamine levels. And so you can effectively reinforce liking doing adrenaline junkie things it is reinforcing itself because by doing that, you increase dopamine levels, which is literally training your brain to want to repeat that behavior. Um, I always, people always ask, it's usually one of the standard questions people ask about um, is what's, what's my favorite molecule? Technically, everybody's favorite molecule is dopamine. Technically, dopamine is the only thing anybody enjoys um, because it's most closely tied to feelings of pleasure in the brain. And, anything you like doing, it's because it releases and increases dopamine levels. Um, and the other question, the other really common one people talk about is serotonin. Um, and the reason I want to talk about these ones in particular is one, like I mentioned, serotonin is tied to a lot of psychiatric diseases. Um, so low serotonin levels, it's correlated with depression. High serotonin levels is actually correlated not just with that being in a better mood, but also with schizophrenia, once you get past a certain threshold. Um, and most, most hallucinogens, especially psychedelic hallucinogens, basically mess with your serotonin levels, um, which is why taking psychedelic drugs, if you have a family history of schizophrenia, is a really bad idea, because you're messing with a system that's already tied to something that you have a, a predisposition for. I'm sorry, did you say that people with schizophrenia produce more extra serotonin? Yes, and so we don't we don't know if it's causative, but we do know that their serotonin levels are elevated well beyond what the average person's um, serotonin levels are. So high serotonin is tied to schizophrenia and bipolar disorder, low serotonin levels is tied to depression. So it's definitely plays a role in mental health in a lot of ways. But we don't know if it's causative and we don't know how linked it is to all these others. And you know what causes that specifically, and why it causes, or you know um, what what about um, emotion is caused by any of these? Where we just know that they're linked. So, like I said, a lot of stuff still going on. But the, and the other cool thing about this, the act, actual question somebody asked was, what's significant about, about the structure of serotonin? Well, Nothing really. It turns out it's it's a convenient molecular shape because it turns out all four of these, what are called the monoamine um, neurotransmitters, are actually just a couple atoms off from being standard amino acids that your body uses to make proteins. If you take phenylalanine, 
and you remove a carboxylic acid group from right here and add a couple of OHs, you get dopamine. If you take tryptophan and you remove the carboxylic acid group and you add that oxygen right there, you get serotonin. So basically, these are just convenient molecules that happen to already be around in a slightly different form in, in bodies. And that's why a lot of different organisms produce similar molecules, like naturally occurring drugs that affect humans exist mostly because other organisms also use the same 20 amino acids we do. So they just have dip, they have chemical transmitters or chemical messengers that work on different systems for them, but then they mess with ours as well. So do mood stabilizers take on like similar molecular structure? The mood stabilizers in general, in psych, psych meds in general, are not that well understood. The exact mechanisms are not necessarily well understood. A lot of times what they do is they try to kind of limit any peaks and valleys. So it's basically, it's especially for treating things like bipolar disorder, you don't want to get someone to get manic, but you also don't want them to get depressed. And so you give them drugs to try and keep all of these right in the middle and keep them from fluctuating which has the effect of basically like leveling out all your emotion and you have no more emotion, or at least that's the way it's described by people on that have bipolar disorder, taking those mood stabilizers and mess with the way that you feel in a way that prevents you from committing suicide, but also prevents you from you know feeling as creative or feeling as good when you do things. Um, and if you want a good example, maybe good example might be the wrong word, um, an example of, someone who stops taking their mood stabilizers for something like bipolar or schizophrenia um, is Kanye West. Um, he's known for being bipolar. He's, di he's um, diagnosed bipolar, was on mood stabilizers, but has a history of when he's ready to go into the studio and write new music, he stops taking his meds because it allows him to feel like those highs and those lows more. Problem is he's also surrounded by enablers that tell him he doesn't need to take those meds and he shouldn't go back on them. And then you get the Kanye West we have today. Um, but that's that's a really common thread in in people that are taking that take psych meds or that have bipolar disorder because they don't like the way the mood stabilizers just make them feel. So anyway, um, and I just threw up the the actual structures. There is there's phenylalanine and tryptophan. And if you can picture taking off these this acid group, this CO2H group from each of them, you get um, dopamine and serotonin. So it's just kind of a, just a convenient way of, of using those. Basically, take something you already have a lot of, tweak it a little bit so it doesn't get accidentally used to be an amino acid anymore, and now you have something you can use as a as a chemical messenger. So it's, just, it's the cellular equivalent of using scratch paper that you have too much of to write a note to somebody. Just kind of cool. Um, and that also explains why different organisms produce similar molecules, but for very different systems. If, you know, tryptophan and dopamine and nor noradrenaline and adrenaline have an effect on us, it's not the same as the effect it might have on lizards. For instance, they might use the same molecules, but for different systems. All right. <clears throat> we can talk all day about that, and there will be in Chem 103, there's actually a section on um, biochem, a little brief introduction to biochemistry that talks, has a, a brief section on chemical messengers and hormones versus neurotransmitters and how some of those systems work. Um, so you'll get more of that if you take 103. And even more, if you decide to be a biology or chemistry major, you get to take upper division biochemistry, and that's when it really gets interesting. Um, if you actually dive into what specific receptor sites are affected by this molecule versus that molecule, and what does that do to these other systems over there? Um, and then the other main quiz, quiz question people asked, was could we go through number two? Because a lot of people had issues with number two. Um, and the, I, the main thing that I found was I think the, the most common mistake that I saw, I believe, was actually people 
um, misreading the question because I think there were a number of people. If you came up with a number in the 200s, I think that you actually calculated the theoretical yield of of copper iodide, not iodine. Iodine is specifically referring to just that solid. If you found the theoretical yield of copper iodide, that's going to have a different molecular weight, and you wound up, and it's got different stoichiometry, so you wound up with a different um, answer. So if you did not get, was it ninety four? Was the was the right answer? Yeah. If you got something in the two hundreds, and it's not cleanly doubled or halved, um, what the real answer was, then it's probably because you found the wrong compound. So. If we are going to try to solve this real quick, um, the nice thing about this problem, where I was kind to you, is I said it has excess potassium iodide. It doesn't seem like that's that helpful, except for the fact that it means that we don't need to worry about limiting reactants at least. Right? So basically, it just means if we don't know how much potassium iodide we have, we just know we're not running out. So that just eliminates a step, makes it a lot simpler. If you know what that's trying to tell you. So if we have excess potassium iodide, we don't care about how much potassium iodide we have. How many grams of iodine are produced from 25 milliliters at a certain solution? So again, first step one, it's already given to you balance, but you might want to double check that. But if you're if it's balanced, then the next step is always what for these stoichiometry problems. What do we do? Get to moles. Get to moles. And I guess one, one of the other questions was, how do we know if it's a stoichiometry problem? I keep saying the first step, if it's a stoichiometry problem, is to put everything in moles and balance it. How do you know it's a stoichiometry problem? Anytime it's asking you about an amount of something produced or an amount of something used up, it's a stoichiometry problem. Anytime you've got a reaction, and the question says you have this much of one chemical, how much produced or used of a different chemical, it's a stoichiometry problem. Like that is the whole definition of stoichiometry is we're trying to compare amounts of one chemical to amounts of another chemical. And so as soon as you see that, you know it's stoichiometry, you know you just wanna make sure it's balanced and get everything in moles. So 425 milliliters, is our amount of the copper two chloride. And we're given a concentration in moles per liter. So we just need to start by getting the liters. Thousand milliliters, it's one liter. I did see at least one person who, who turned in their work. Switch those two numbers. So there's a thousand liters is one milliliter. Again, easy to do. Just watch your reasonableness check because especially when you're going fast, it's easy to mess that up. And then once you're in liters, we use our concentration. Capital N means moles per liter, or one liter equals that many moles. So per liter on bottom, 1.75 moles, copper to chloride on top. We get something like, uh, something just on, around 0.8. Where we at the most? 0.74375. 743. What do we do with sig figs? Round off. But where? Three. We do sig figs? Why? Because we started with 425 milliliters. And this is also a measured number. Concentrations are also measured. Right? So Three sig figs there, three sig figs there. Our answer should have three sig figs. That gives us moles of copper two chloride. Then we're just going to turn around and we're going to do our stoichiometry step to figure out how many moles of iodine we can make and then use the molecular weight of iodine to get to grams of iodine. And so we go to this point. So we've got moles of copper two chloride. Now we look at 
a coefficients of the two things we care about. Doesn't as long as it's balanced, we don't care about anything other than the two the what we have and what we're trying to figure out. And once we get to the you know limiting reagent, if we had a limiting reagent problem, we had numbers for potassium iodide. Once we know what's running out first, we still don't care about the other one unless it's an excess reagent question. All that matters really is what your limiting reactant is. And what are we asking about? What's the other compound? So in this case, for every two moles of copper two chloride, one mole of iodine produced. And then if we want to do this last all in one step, we could use the molecular weight of iodine here at the same time to say, okay, for every one mole of I2, is how many grams? So iodine is big, I don't know, it's 120 something. Or something okay, so we have two iodine atoms makes one molecule of iodine. So you need to double that atomic mass. So we have 200, 244. Is that what you said? Okay. And we can keep more sig figs, but we don't really need to because we're only going to keep three of the, for our final answer anyway. Make sure your atomic mass has at least as many sig figs as what you're trying to, to keep. Just give me one, just give me the dense place. So eight. When in doubt, it's better. If you if it's easy and you're you have your table in front of you, might as well keep one extra sig fig on this. You only need two technically. Keep three same things here, but you'll get a better answer if you keep one extra. All right, so then we plug this in 0.743 divided by two times 253.8 should give us our 94.4 grams produced. The common place that people have issues using with these sort of conversions. Um, one issue is that people tend to look at if there's a coefficient in front of something, people say, well, does that affect the molecular weight? No, the coefficient does not affect the molecular weight. The coefficient affects how fast that molecule or that compound is produced, not what the molecular weight of that compound is. So the molecular weight is just based on what is the formula of that compound, not what is the coefficient in front of it. So just just to make that clear, to put it in, go back to a food analogy. Um, it doesn't matter if you're putting two pieces of cheese on a cheeseburger. That doesn't affect how much each slice of cheese weighs, right? It affects how fast you're using the cheese up, but not what each piece of cheese weighs. All right, any other questions on the quiz? Quiz questions. Yeah, I mean, uh, it's similar to I have well, similar like practice testing to do the type of reaction, the oxidized and reducing agent. That's the process that you go through to figure out if it's redox or not redox, and then it is redox. So I'm gonna tell you, hold on to that one, just like I did before. Um, we'll get into reaction type. We can we'll review that stuff after after break. Okay. <laughs> Uh, anything else I was going to say here? Oh, the practice test does have a weird question on it that was not intended to be so weird. The one with the concentration of water. Uh, that one was just me not thinking clearly about the type of question when I wrote that. So it basically said you're not going to run out of water. Your water is your excess reagent. Says find your concentration of the excess reagent at the end of the reaction. That it really doesn't make any sense to find the concentration of water in itself after a reaction because it doesn't change. Um, you can still go through the process for the sake of having some practice, um, but a better yes, a better practice problem that looks just like that one is uh, right here. I, it's in the slides that are uploaded. You could you could even just cross out the one that I asked for the excess reagent. Is it number nine? Use these numbers instead. 
and this would this would make more sense uh, because you're actually using up measurable amounts and have a difference in the change in concentration at the end. Right, so, and again, this one is uh, is the second to last slide on today's PDF of slides. So, just so if if you wind up with something that seems like it doesn't make sense on number nine, that's because it doesn't. I asked a bad question because um, I was going fast and I really had to cover this question. I don't remember it. Look. All right, let's talk about the last few new topics. <laughs> the first of which isn't really new. We've covered this. We did the derivation for the ideal gas law um, and in class on Tuesday. But just so you see it again, remember we had these three laws relating pressure and volume and temperature in moles to each other. And we said, okay, well, if all of these things are proportional to each other, we can actually combine all of them and say, okay, well, volume is therefore proportional to moles times temperature over pressure. And proportional is another way of saying that if you graph these things, if you plot it, volume versus any of those others, but let's just call it temperature, you would get a straight line that goes through the origin. So in other words, another way of writing this volume is proportional to all these variables is to say volume is equal to a constant times all these variables. The constant is just the slope of this line. So if we give that constant a name and rearrange it just so it's not a fraction, we get the most common version of the ideal gas law, which is pressure times volume is equal to moles times a constant times the temperature. So as long as you have three of these four variables, R is, the, is a constant no matter what gas we're talking about. So as long as you have three of the four, you can calculate the fourth pretty easily. Right, so this is gonna be our number one way that we can get to moles based on measurable quantities for gas. All right, so uh, R is, has lots of different units. So remember with those simple gas laws, with the change gas laws, the before and after gas laws, we didn't really worry about the units for pressure or volume because it, as long as it was the same on both sides, it was going to cancel out anyway, right? But now this is not dealing with a change. This is dealing with one system and it has that constant in it. And that means we do need to worry about units now. And so the most... The value of R that's given on your um, equation sheet, there's actually, sorry, there's technically two values of R given on your equation sheet. It turns out R shows up in, in energy equations later on. It turns out R is actually related to fundamentals of how the universe works. The universe, statistics in our universe behave in a certain way. And the way that the statistics work in our universe involves R. So R actually shows up in a lot of different places. In gas laws, we put it in gas units. Um, if we're dealing with physics or if we we're dealing with uh, energy, then we'd be, we'd be dealing with an R body that had joules in it instead of atmospheres and liters. So with that in mind, paying attention to your units on R is gonna be really helpful to make sure that you didn't forget to convert something. It's really tempting since R is always the same. It's really tempting to just not write your units because that's a really, that's a big mess of a, of a unit to have to write every time when you're doing this. Write it anyway, because it's going to remind you if you wind up with atmospheres on one side and Tor as your pressure on the other side, they're not going to cancel out, right? And that should help you remember, oh wait, I can't just plug in pressure and Tor. I need to convert Tor to atmospheres. Right, so it's just a clue to remind you of that, um, even though it's tempting to ignore that because R is always the same. Um, and you can also look up, you look up um, gas constant on, just to give you an idea, 
These are all the different values of R in the various units. So basically any combination of absolute temperature, pressure, and volume units is going to have its own value for R. So we just pick the ones that are most common in chemistry, liters, atmospheres, and Kelvin. But there's here's a value for R that has BTU, which stands for British thermal unit. That's a, an energy unit times pounds per mole per degree rain time. You can get any combination you want out of these. That's why we just pick one and go with it instead of listing six different values of R on your conversion sheet. It's easier to just convert everything to atmospheres and meters. So let's practice using these. Two liter bottle is sealed at sea level at 25 Celsius and 760 torr. How many moles of gas are in the bottle? Pressure is given in Tor to start by converting it to atmospheres because we need all of our units to match what we have up here. So pressure goes to atmospheres. Volume is 2.0 liters. We're already good on our volume unit, right? Temperature is given in Celsius. 298.15. And so to put it in Kelvin, we have to add 273.15 and then round to the ones place because that's where our uncertainty is. So we get so 273.15 plus 25. 298 Kelvin. So we know pressure, we know volume, we know temperature, we know R. Plug and chuck, plug everything in, solve for N. Again, you can, you can do your algebra first if you want to move the variables around and solve for N before you plug things in. It might be less writing. Um, depends on how comfortable you are with algebra, but I'm not going to be super picky when it comes to grading. Write it how it works for you. If I rearrange it first, divide both sides by RT. You get moles equals pressure times volume over R over T. So 1.00 atmospheres times 2.0 liters over 0 0.08206 liters times atmospheres mole times Kelvin times 298 Kelvin. So if we're tracking our units, which we should always be doing, right? Got atmospheres on top and atmospheres on bottom. Atmospheres cancels out. Got liters on top and liters on bottom. Liters cancels out. Got Kelvin and one over Kelvin. Kelvin times one over Kelvin is going to cancel out as well, right? Or like in our units of one over one over moles or moles. And anytime you get a unit, it's one over one over something. Another way of writing that would be one divided by one over moles. Remember, when you divide fractions, it's the same as multiplying by the reciprocal, right? So you would flip this and you just get moles as your unit. <laughs> 
So final answer winds up being what? 9 to 10. 0 0.1 or so? 0 0.1? 0 0.8? 0 0 and give me one more. Well, that's unfortunate. I did not mean this is purely coincidence that it wound up um, being really close to the value of R. That is just coincidence based on how I picked the numbers. It's not always going to be that. I'm not trying to complain by doing that. Just unlucky. Easy enough to use this equation, right? It's a little bit more than just being able to get to moles by doing a couple of conversions because you have to plug everything into this equation at the same time. You can't just do it like it's a just a conversion problem. But it's not really any harder than a conversion problem. Look at your units, figure out what variable goes where and has what values. Make sure your units work out. And then just solve for the variable you're missing. Questions on this one? All right, let's make it more complicated. <laughs> because that's what we do in chemistry, right? Um, 2.0.82. If this sample is 78 percent nitrogen gas by mole. How many grams of nitrogen gas are in that bottle? Now it's a little bit of a conversion problem. When we see a percentage in a word problem, what should we do? What's your first instinct from this class? It's going to be over 100. It's yeah, out of 100, but what is 100 versus 78? What are our units? 0 0.78. 0 0.78 is the decimal version. A percentage is a conversion. That's where you were going with the 100, right? Per 100. For it. So what does this mean as a conversion? For every 100 what, there's 78 what? Grams. For every 100 grams of atmosphere, there's that would be if this was a percent by mass. That would be the way. And it's not specified. I said it out loud, but I didn't write it in the problem statement. I said this is a percentage by mole. So out of the 0 0.082, 70 percent of that is. So out of this, for every 100 moles of gas, 78 of those moles are nitrogen gas. So there's our conversion. So we can say, okay, well, 78 moles of N2 equals 100 moles of atmosphere or moles of gas. So if this is just moles of gas, we can convert moles of gas to moles of nitrogen. And if we have moles of nitrogen, what are we going to do? Molecular weight, we get to grams. So 0 0.082 moles of gas, and for every 100 moles of gas, 78 moles of nitrogen. And for every one mole of nitrogen, it's going to be 28, 0.01 maybe grams. What the atomic mass of nitrogen is 14 point something more than that. Yeah, so 28.01 is good enough. Or keep more sig figs if you're plugging into your calculator and you have it right in front of you. Moles of gas cancels moles of gas, and we're left in moles of nitrogen. Moles of nitrogen cancels moles of nitrogen, and we're left in grams of nitrogen. We get it. Fairly small number. What do we get? 1.8? 1.8. 1.8. 
1.8 or, or 0. 1.8. 1. 1. 1. Okay. I guess that is still well over 20th, and then we're multiplying by 20. Okay. I believe that. I had to convince myself I was thinking I was expecting something closer to one than two. So the ideal gas loss, this is this question is really based on the reinforce that the ideal gas loss still fits into our regular problem solving. Just occasionally, if we have a gas, we need three variables to figure out how many moles we have, as opposed to just needing a volume and a concentration, or just needing um, a mass and molecular weight. If it's a gas, we have extra variables. And so we have to do this before we can just start throwing it into conversion problems. But it still works the same way as far as the problem solving. And the other point that this is trying to make is just reminding us, I mentioned this the other day, we talked about partial pressures. Basically, because all of these gas molecules are also far apart, they don't interact with each other at all. That's one of the assumptions of the ideal gas law, right? That there's no forces in between the various atoms. So basically, if we know something is 78% nitrogen, then we can just treat it like the other if all we care about is nitrogen, we can just ignore the other 22%. You say, okay, well, the other 22% is there. We don't know what it is and we don't really care because the question only asks about nitrogen. So we're just going to ignore the rest of it. Think back to the think back to the goldfish problem with percentages. Right? The goldfish problem asked you about sodium or uh, sodium consumption doesn't mean that there's only sodium in the goldfish. It just means we don't care about any, anything but the sodium. So we can just ignore it. We do the same thing with gases. We can just treat them like they're all separate. And just because it's kind of interesting to visualize, uh, atmospheric pressure, gas molecules really don't run into each other very much at all. On average, a gas molecule will travel, if you can picture being, traveling from here to Jupiter. Um, if you got at your current size, that's roughly the same as the distance proportionally that a gas molecule will travel before it hits another gas molecule. So gas molecules are roughly as far apart on average as from here to Jupiter. That's not quite right. That's, that's how far they travel before they run into each other on average, but it just makes the point, there's a lot of empty space in the gas. So this assumption that those molecules don't run into each other very much is good at atmospheric pressure. When you get to super high pressures, that starts falling apart. All right, uh, here's another practice one. It's kind of a word problem that involves PV equals NRT. Uh, I'm just gonna talk about it. I'm not gonna solve it all day so we can keep moving here. But basically, if you're giving system um, of gases and you have a pressure, a volume, and a temperature, you can get moles, right? You can get moles, you can get grams. So if we want to know what the density is of this system, what's our definition of density? Mass over. Mass over volume. Well, volume is given. So if we want to know the density, we just need the mass of gas in the system. So we'd start by solve for N, use the molecular weight to get to grams like we just did, and then plug that in here. Right? So again, nothing we haven't seen before. This is just all showing different ways that PV equals NRT plugs in with a lot of the same concepts we've been talking about. For a long time at this point, right? It's been 10 weeks ago, the first time we started doing density word problems. And it's still around. Um, this one is mostly interesting because it flips. What's the order? Instead of using P, B, and T to find moles, if we did something like stoichiometry, 
where we were producing moles of gas, we could ask about any of the other variables. We could say, okay, what volume does that gas occupy at one atmosphere and zero Celsius? Plug in one atmosphere for pressure, zero Celsius, but in Kelvin for temperature. Plug in your 1.8 moles for N, and you're solving the volume now, right? Again, recognizing the units and what number goes with what variable is really the only tricky part about using PV equals NRT. Just watch your units, make sure you don't do something like plug in your temperature where the pressure goes. Right? It almost goes without saying at this point because we've gotten so used to looking at units and from the unit, you can tell what it, whether it's a distance or a volume or et cetera. But just to reiterate, since pressure are new units to us, Make sure you're tracking that. Um, but then it's just a matter of, it's just like they say, Matt, plug and chug. And so this allows us to use PV equals NRT at the end of a stoichiometry problem instead of at the beginning. Instead of getting to moles, this allows us to get to use moles to get to some other measurable variable. So we can do something like a percent yield or a theoretical yield in units of meters, which is weird, but they actually measure how much gas you produce in terms of liters a lot of the time, because it's a really easy conversion to get to liters. So if we plug all this in, pressure's already in. Actually, let's give it some more sig figs. Put everything with three, with, uh, three sig figs. So one atmosphere, volume is what we're solving for, moles is 1.48. R is still R. Liters, atmospheres per mole Kelvin. Times, and then our temperature is in Celsius, so we've got to put it in Kelvin. It's easy in this case, right? Because we're adding zero to 273.15. So it's 273.2 Kelvin. Get something right around 33. Give me one more sig fig on it. Isn't it just two though? Uh, I threw in an extra okay. um, same thing on the atmosphere so we can do one more. <laughs> and just a reminder since our conversion to Kelvin involves addition, that means that even though there's only two sig figs on degrees Celsius, the uncertainty is in the tenth place. So when we add our 273.15, we're going to keep the uncertainty in the tenths place. So we actually gain sig figs when you convert from Celsius to Kelvin. And that's normal. Just, just a reminder that we have those two different sets of rules. All right. So so these this particular set of conditions is pretty common. Commonly used, we say one at one atmosphere and zero Celsius. It's really convenient to convert zero Celsius to Kelvin, right? It's really easy. Plus, before about 1970 or so, um, does anybody know what the average global temperature on Earth is? It's ballpark. Degrees Celsius. That's that's in uh, in heated rooms. Yes. Um, but if you consider the entire atmosphere, the average temperature um, is actually really close to zero Celsius, um, especially if you're talking about the atmosphere, but also the oceans. The oceans, on average, don't get that, that much above zero Celsius. On the surface, they get a little bit above that, but the average temperature of the water in the ocean is it's actually four Celsius because that's the temperature where water is the most compact. Um, but beside the point, this is a really good estimate for if you're picking some environments at random around Earth, 
it's a decent chance it's going to be about zero Celsius. So these are just convenient numbers to use. So they call these standard temperature and pressure or STP, which yeah, I used to, everybody used to, oh, STP. Um, but now that I'm now much older than most of you, um, this was actually the name of a grunge band in the 90s. So I actually know this Stone Temple Pilots. Um, but STP, standard temperature and pressure, same thing. Some of their songs hold up. They're okay. They're no sound garden. Thank you about my grunge. Um, would anything really change about this process if it wasn't an STP? I just plug in a different pressure and a different temperature, right? So if we want to do at our atmospheric pressure, at room temperature, we would just plug in different numbers. The other advantage, I guess we'll see it in a second. Let's say we had exactly one mole of gas at exactly STP. What's the volume of one mole of gas at one atmosphere of pressure and zero Celsius? How would we solve that? More of the same, right? We're looking for volume, but yeah. in one could be one atmosphere. T is temperature, so zero Celsius is our standard conditions. So 273 Kelvin. Where we got the be? I think that's seven forty four. Seven forty four? Oh. Three point four. It depends on the six things we keep. So the other that the other valuable piece of having standard temperature and pressure described means it does actually allow us to use ideal gas law as just a one-step conversion. Because if we know that we're at STP, the only things that are changing necessarily are moles or the volume, right? And for we this allows us to write a conversion that says at STP, One mole gas equals 22.414 liters. So, if we're at standard temperature and pressure, that actually makes it even easier to get back and forth between, between liters and moles. You don't even need to actually plug everything into the ideal gas law if we're at STP. This only works at STP. And it's actually even on your conversion sheet. You might not have known what to do with it because we just added gases, but there's a conversion probably under the pressure units that says at SDP, one, one mole equals 22.414 liters. So that would have made this problem really easy. We could then say 1.48 moles at STP one mole is 22.414 liters. This conversion just has the ideal gas law embedded in it. It has PV equals NRT embedded in it because we're saying not standard temperature and pressure. This only works at, at STP. And we could define our own like Lake Tahoe STP, if we wanted to, and say Lake Tahoe standard is 
0 0.8 atmospheres and 20 Celsius. And we, then we can do the same thing and say, what's the volume of one, of one mole of gas under those conditions? And have our own conversion here. But not enough people live at our altitude to make that worthwhile to teach on a, on a regular basis. Right. Just so you've seen STP, I believe the, the problem on the take home or on the practice test might even say add STP. So you don't have to remember how to do this. You can just use PV equals NRT every time. You still got to have all the right information, but you can save yourself some writing if you know what you're doing. I talked about that. Um, we've talked a lot about mole fraction before. So we said, remember that's that Greek letter chi. It looks like a sort of an italicized X. Mole fraction is kind of like percent by mole, um, except it's not multiplied by 100. So you could say, okay, mole fraction of any component A is equal to moles of A divided by moles of A. The interesting thing about that is if we know of this equation, if you increase moles, what does that do to pressure? pressure? Increases pressure, right? Moles and pressure are proportional to each other, which means we can actually do a substitution with pressure and moles. So not only is the mole fraction equal to moles of A over moles total, it's also equal to the pressure of A over the pressure total. Or if we were in constant pressure and we were looking at volumes, volume of A divided by volume total. Because both volume and pressure are directly proportional to moles, which the most common way we see this used is it just is the same way that we did it a few slides ago when we found out how many moles of nitrogen we had based on the percentage. That basically just doing this allows us to say, well, if we have one atmosphere of gas molecules, if for every 100 atmospheres of gas molecules, there's this many atmospheres of component A. So it just means we can use pressure units instead of just moles to get to mole fraction, which seems a little bit cheating. Um, it seems like we're making assumptions there. We are. We're making the assumption that all of our gas molecules are identical and that they don't interact with each other. So basically the same assumptions that we normally make with the idea of gas. So this is just more ways that we can kind of use these same ideas and things that we can directly measure to get to moles. Because we can measure pressure directly, which means we can get to mole fraction just by measuring total pressure and pressure of a specific gas. Or if we have this for a specific system, we can get to pressure of nitrogen is equal to the pressure total times the mole fraction of nitrogen. And so this is just more ways we have of sort of rearranging things. I believe that shows up on the take home. Um, there's one more thing. I know, I know it's about time for a break, but the one more concept that I would want to go over before we and then we can totally just review when we come back is the ideal gas law makes two assumptions. We talked about these the other day, but just to reiterate, we're, we're assuming that the gas molecules themselves have zero volume. And that's a good assumption as long as we're close to atmospheric pressure because there's so much empty space in between gas molecules like we talked about. So under normal conditions, that's a decent assumption. They still take up volume, but they take up such a small fraction of the total volume that it gets lost in the sig phase. The other one we're assuming is that the molecules do not interact with each other or with the walls of the container. In other words, they just bounce around like billiard balls and bounce cleanly off each other. They don't stick at all. 
and it also means there's no phase changes. If either of these assumptions is not true, we can't really use the ideal gas law. So if you get to high pressures, then all of a sudden, assumption one starts falling apart. At high enough pressures, your gas molecules will occupy a measurable amount of the space. And so your total volume of empty space in the container is not um, the same because some of it is being taken up by the other gas molecules. And if you have polar molecules, then assumption two, especially at high pressures, assumption two falls apart because polar molecules have partial positives and partial negatives, right? If you have two water molecules run into each other and they happen to have the positive end of one molecule run into the negative end of the other molecule, they're going to stick together. You're going to see condensation start to happen under the right conditions. And so the way that we adjust for these, if we can't make these two assumptions, we have to use the Van der Waals gas equation. And Van der Waals gas equation <laughs> is basically still PV equals NRT, just with two tweaks to it. The right-hand side still is identical, right? It's NRT. The left-hand side, the volume term has this little subtraction thing tied onto it. It's basically saying, okay, the volume of the entire container minus the number of molecules, and then it's got this B term. B is effectively how big every mole of gas is. If you have a mole of gas condensed down to a solid, how much space would it take up? And then so you just subtract that from the total volume. Makes sense, right? It's a, it's a really easy adjustment to make. Um, just, okay, well, if you have enough gas molecules that are taking up space, subtract off the space that the gas molecules take up from your total volume. This one's a little bit weird. The pressure plus A, which is another constant you have to look up. Basically, A is how attracted are the gas molecules to each other. So for polar molecules to have a lot of strong attractive forces, A is a big number, relatively speaking. For molecules that have almost no interactions, for nonpolar molecules, A is really small. And then this other piece of it, this N over V squared, what's N divided by V? What's moles divided by moles over molarity, basically, right? It's a concentration. How many gas molecules do you have? And what's the volume that they're spread out of? So basically, this term in the square is basically how likely are two gas molecules to run into each other? Because the probability of one gas molecule being in this space and then another gas molecule being trying to be in the same space is the concentration times itself times this A value, which is how attracted those molecules are to each other in the first place. So we can, from a statistics point of view, we can look at this and say, okay, well, this, why would we ever use PV equals NRT if we have something better? Because this is a really messy equation, right? Not only that, but every different gas has its own A and B. And this doesn't take into account the account fact that if you have a mixture of gases, then, so say we have a mixture of oxygen gas and nitrogen gas. A for oxygen running into oxygen is different than A for nitrogen running in for nitrogen, which is different than A for oxygen running into nitrogen, which is, so we basically, as soon as you start incorporating mixtures of gases, it gets really hard to actually do this. Not to mention, in fact, if I ask you to solve for moles, if we try to use this to figure out how many moles we have, this is going to be really messy, right? Because we have this n squared times this, we have to foil things, and then we and then wind up with an n squared term, an n to the third term, an n to the first term. We wind up with a with a uh, cubic quadratic that we have to solve. 
trying to solve for n. So it's really, really nasty. We really don't want to use this one unless we have to, unless these assumptions are no good. I believe the take home test has you do this once. At one of the, there's a gas law question. I think the last part of it is let's assume that we can't use the ideal gas law and you have to use this equation. I don't think I have you solve for volume or night or moles though, because it gets really nasty. You basically have to use a solver. Um, so, but solving for pressure is not hard. Solving for temperature is not hard. It's just moles and volume. You get really nasty if you have to do this. All right, let's let's take our break. We'll come back. We'll do a half hour of review. I'll make sure there's no other last minute topics that I didn't get to yet. Okay, come back in at twenty after. Sort of. Yeah. 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 So B is, is basically the uh, 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 mole of gas takes out. Yeah. 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 Yeah, I the yeah, I mean, it's not a service theory. That's including the material. So you're looking at the atmospheric temperature. Average across the region, the temperature is one eight Celsius warmer. So that's it. That's the change. Uh, okay. And this, even this one, uh, the surface of the Earth. But the atmosphere goes several miles above the surface. I just want to learn more about that because I was just never read the Let me see if I can find a good source. Let's see global surface temperature. Mm -hmm. Actually, you know what, what had it was that uh, that Excel lab we did where we looked at where we analyzed the surface temperature anomaly. Um, I believe the same place that I got that was the surface temperature. Yeah, yeah. So maybe an obvious or that maybe, maybe it should be because. When we're talking about gases, we don't care about money temperature, pushing temperature, we don't care about And so that's, that's probably. I just wanted to see. Yeah, so yeah. that's a good, that's a good double check. I, like I said, I did not identify it as a And that's, that's a good estimate for anything that is, that, and maybe I, mean, I was just missing out on that. Okay. So remember that most of most of the atmosphere is above our our altitude. Okay. And so if you if you look at if you consider just the surface temperature versus the temperature, then I guess are sea level. Yeah, these ones are at sea level. And sea. 
You, I, I'm sure you can find like a somewhere. I just don't know how. How do you average all of those different elevations together? That's gonna be a lot of. And like we're that's part of it. You just take you model it. You measure it a couple of different altitudes, and then you model it. Actually, they can look at it in terms of uh, yeah, from a satellite. I don't know if they could they would have numbers necessarily from back compared to when you look at satellites available, but from the terrain. Well, here you can do a pretty good analysis. They have to like close. They have to like close terms, right? I know. Well, like if you want to measure something, I just feel like you have to set it up. Parameters. Yeah. Because if you stop the stage, you're going to get even higher than that. Yeah. 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 And that, like, just it goes back to like, the question of like, the problem is the atmosphere has never really stopped. It's kind of the same way. Right, it exponentially approaches or it's riches. Um, there you there's your line. Okay, 62 miles above sea level. So 99.99 miles. So if you go 62 miles above sea level, and then you go that then of course you're different. And then all of a sudden you see that many of us yeah, it kind of up more stuff. There's a maybe, but there's like that. There's more of a big experience. Yeah. Where the very upper atmosphere will actually be hotter than the atmosphere. Yeah, yeah. Like on the sky. But it's also misleading because the pressure is so low. So you would still like feel the freezing effect because there's right. still the particles that it's it's not so much that you feel necessarily feel freezing at that level. Um, if you were inside, it can be let's it wouldn't necessarily be the stage, but that's our difference. For instance, for the stage, it actually probably because you can't disperse the like, so you so it's just your skin exposed, your skin wants to have all of this. That is not your skin. Yeah, and it's not all of this. And that is not your skin. So if you were to allow all of this, you have to be inside of something that doesn't have to be involved in it. That's right. That's right. But I That's an interesting one because they also have friction traveling really fast. So you have the air resistance, yeah, right? it's friction as well. And that is a very What else am I going to So I would ask that they don't have air condition necessarily, but no, I think there's not necessarily a they are probably not qualified. Especially if they don't have a it's heard about the SRS. Oh, yeah. Well, yeah, that is too. You can't run that so much with a big friction and stretch it. This is sort of weird. 
so much that it actually uh, that's would be very exciting. Okay. Yeah, they're like they designed the Student, I think it's like, um, I was like, 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 yeah, I mean, yeah. 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 Yeah, I'm trying to explain how you know gas lot gas lots in general. Um, this is basically one one of the birthplaces of statistical mechanics, and it's also in statistical thermodynamics, which is basically um, applying statistics to the system of an entire mole of, of atoms in time. So, if you have an entire mole of atoms, that's a statistically significant. Right? We trust that that's going to behave in a way. It's not a small sample size. It's lots of atoms and molecules. And so basically back in the, this would have been probably the early 1800s, mid 1800s, um, physicists and chemists started trying to apply physics ideas to individual molecules at the scale of molecules. And really one of the places, some of the places where this fails is what led to the birth of quantum mechanics. Because if you try to apply classical mechanics to too small of a system, then they behave like more like quantum particles rather than classical particles. And when I say classical, I mean like obeys Newtonian physics, normal, normal microscopic physics. So basically, what they did is they said, okay, well, we'll have this equation for kinetic energy of an object, and it's equal to one half the mass of that object times the velocity squared. Well, so if we treat every gas molecule like it's its own object, we can still do the same thing. We can figure out what the mass of the individual uh, molecule is, and we can figure out you can, the velocity actually um, because kinetic energy is tied to the temperature. Right? And so they were able to derive a way to get to kinetic energy from temperature. And then we could actually do things like figure out how fast individual molecules are moving um, at various temperatures, which is kind of cool. You can calculate things like. Um, if I'm remembering right, the average gas molecule at room temperature is moving something close to 100 miles an hour. But I'd have to go back through and double check my numbers on that because I'm going really from memory and I don't remember it that well. So don't quote me on that one. But we can get a number in terms of the meters per second for gas molecules, which is kind of cool. Um, why does that matter? And actually, why is it written like this over here? Well, this is if it's the average kinetic energy, if we're dealing with an entire, what they call an ensemble of molecules, instead of just one molecule at a time, then we don't have just one velocity, we have a distribution of velocities. We have an average velocity, but these things behave according to something similar to a bell curve. The velocity of all the individual molecules is going to be based on 
temperature, and it's going to be distributed something like So if we say the number of uh, molecules versus kinetic energy or velocity for that matter, it's gonna look kind of like a bell curve, except it stops at zero because you can't have negative velocity. We're talking about how fast these things are moving. They have to be moving. They can't be moving slower than zero. So it's not a true bell curve. It's actually what's called a Boltzmann distribution. It's not a Gaussian distribution. It's a slightly different function. And the shape of this function is actually where R comes from. Because it turns out the shape of this function, N, is going to be at any given, maybe it's the integral of N. The integral of N with respect to kinetic energy is equal to this term for RT. Or different temperatures, this, this function flattens out and looks a little different. Um, just to prep you for the fact that this distribution keeps coming back when we start talking about energies and reactions happening, um, this and this form of that function keeps coming back. Turns out statistical thermodynamics is really, really important in chemistry. And this equation shows up all over the place, and R shows up all over the place. Um, so what that means effectively, though, is at this point, it just means that we have an average kinetic energy. And instead of velocity, they, they write it like this. This is the average velocity of the entire ensemble. They write it as u with a bar over it instead of uh, just calling it velocity squared. <clears throat> so what this means is that Yes, all of our gas molecules behave the same way as far as pressure goes, because they all have the same average kinetic energy, regardless if we're talking about argon versus carbon dioxide. But that doesn't mean they're all traveling the same speed. Think about throwing a golf ball with a certain amount of energy and then throwing a bowling ball with the same amount of energy. The bowling ball might have the same amount of energy, but it's gonna be going a lot slower if that's the case. And so if they all have the same average kinetic energy, they can still be traveling at different speeds if they weigh differently, if they weigh different amounts. So the way that we apply this is basically saying, okay, if assuming that they're all the same temperature or that, that your, your system is all the same temperature, that means all of your molecules, or all of your types of molecules have the same average kinetic energy. So if, if they have the same kinetic energy, if the mass is bigger, is it going to be moving slower or faster than another molecule? If it weighs more with the same kinetic energy, it's got to be going slower. Right? And so that allows us to do things like answer these questions. At the same temperature, which gas would have a higher average velocity? Helium. Out of these two, helium would be moving faster because it's smaller. So again, really obvious macroscopic ideas that get here and abstract and we apply them to molecules. But the logic is the same. So out of CO2 or nitrogen, which one weighs more? CO2. CO2. Oxygen weighs more than nitrogen, plus you get the carbon in there. So if CO2 weighs more, nitrogen should be moving faster at the same temperature. So that's not that complicated, but that's also very qualitative. There's nothing, you can't really calculate anything there, but we have these nice equations. So we should be able to calculate things. So if we take, so we, we can actually solve and get an equation for the velo average velocity based on temperature and the mass of, of the um, gas. Um, and we can wind up getting something that is not all that easy to use. We solve for U, which is the velocity. Uh, we wind up with something like 
square root of three over two times R times T over, and there would be multiplying by two, so that's going to cancel out there. Um, N sub A is the number of molecules or Avogadro's number, actually, in this case, divided by mass. That's not all that useful of an equation to use just to get the average velocity of that system. It's a lot of work. You get something that's not even something we can, we can't measure average velocity anyway, right? So this doesn't really get us all that much other than it allows us to solve for relative rates. Instead of just saying faster or slower, we can actually say how much faster the gas um, travels because we can say, okay, the rate of gas A compared to the rate of gas B has this form. Square root of mass molecular weight of B divided by molecular weight of A. So this just is a way to for us to get a um, a number for not just helium moves faster than argon, but how much faster does helium move than argon? And it also this applies not just to their velocities, but how fast they move through a barrier as well. You think about a, a um, buying a helium balloon. It doesn't stay floating for very long, right? A couple of days if it's a regular plastic balloon. It's because the helium literally moves through the membrane of the balloon. And the rate that it moves through relative to nitrogen that's left behind, we can actually figure that out based on this equation. Right, so it still doesn't give us an absolute number for how fast things happen, but it allows us to say helium moves four times faster than nitrogen, for instance. Right, and so that's the way that it shows up. If it, let me double check on the standard rules, there's, no, it doesn't even have you doing that. So it turns out you don't actually need to use this on the take home, but I wanted to show it to you because it will show up in other places sometimes. And I wanted to define the term effuse, which is a gas moving through something or from one point to another point. And so if we wanted to solve this real quick, then we'll, then we'll let you ask questions, like how do we do reaction types? <clears throat> All we need is molecular weight of both of these. So the molecular weight of helium is four, pretty close to four on the money, right? Molecular weight of nitrogen, N2, we already said it's 28.01 grams per mole. We used that earlier. So we want to know the rate of helium compared to the rate of nitrogen. And the square root, notice that these are flipped. A is on top of B on the left, but there's an inverse relationship involved there. So mass of B, which is 28.01 grams per mole. And on bottom, we get four point, what is helium? Four point what? Zero, zero, two, six. Zero, zero, two, three, three, six. thank you. Zero, zero, three, just the same. The grams per mole are going to cancel out, but this just allows us to get a relative answer. So 28 divided by four, seven. it's going to be really close to seven, right? And then we take the square root of that. So the rate of helium diffusing compared to the rate of nitrogen diffusing, it's going to be a square root of seven. So that just tells us that if we had a container filled with both helium and nitrogen, the helium will escape roughly two and a half times faster than the nitrogen will. Which also illustrates one of the problems with using hydrogen as a fuel source in cars. You have to store the hydrogen. Hydrogen is even smaller than helium, right? So storing hydrogen is really, really hard. 
um, in terms of keeping it in a tank without it being lost as waste. Basically, you have to make you have to make the steel for a hydrogen tank about twice as thick as any other type of gas to slow down because it'll actually diffuse through a stainless steel tank um, because hydrogen is so small. So you have to use more steel to slow that process down. <clears throat> All right. So since I kept putting Brendan off when it comes to talking about redox versus not redox and oxidizing each and reuse each and I'm going to start there. Um, but then I also have office hours that go to four. So if anybody wants to keep reviewing things that we're done in um, at uh, 2.50, we'll, we'll take a break in a few minutes. And if you don't come back from, the, from that break, you can, you can be done for the day. But if you have more questions, you want to ask or more reviewing, just come back in here and we'll keep going. Um, we can go until four um, doing review stuff. Okay. All right. And I'm going to start by... Exiting here and pulling up the slides for reaction types. Yeah, so a couple of things about reaction types on the test. So, the test has specifically been asked about this on the stoichiometry problems. So I'm going to give you a reaction. You have to balance it. You have to answer stoichiometry piece. And the last couple points out of the 10 there is going to be what type of reaction is it. And the main thing that I'm looking for, I, first of all, I don't care if you use the, the um, system that they talk about in the lab we did with single replacement versus double replacement, the combination versus synthesis versus decomposition. You can use those to describe these reactions, and I'll give you full credit for that. Um, but that's going to actually be harder in general. Because the most important thing that I'm looking for is, is it a redox reaction or not redox reaction? Now, ideally, you would give me more details and say, okay, it's not a redox reaction and I can recognize it as a precipitation reaction. So precipitation reaction would be the best option. Um, or I can recognize the acid base. The main thing, if you say it's a redox reaction, there are a couple types of redox reactions that are really easy to recognize and categorize. The biggest ones being, is it a metal redox reaction? Do you have a metal changing charge? Or is it a combustion reaction? Gas evolution reactions are usually redox reactions as well, but they can be non-redox reactions in a form of acid-base reaction. So that's not always as universally applicable. Um, the main thing is that you get this distinction. Redox versus non-redox. And so, and with these, knowing with this in mind, you can actually pro approach this like it's a multiple choice question and just sort of eliminate things. So I can look at this and I know it's not a precipitation reaction. I can look at this and it doesn't have oxygen as a reactant, so I know it's not a combustion reaction. Um, there's no metals involved, so it's definitely not a metal metal redox. So my options then get narrowed down a lot more, right? So learn to recognize the easy reaction types and then use process of elimination on the test. This one's definitely not an acid base and move on. Um, but to your question, how do we know what's the, the bulletproof way of telling whether or not something's a redox reaction? Is if the oxidation state of any atom changes 
And oxidation states is just another way of saying charge for the most part. I remember if we have covalent bonds, we don't treat it like it's their individual. It's basically treating covalent bonds like a more electronegative element gets first dip. Make the most electronegative element satisfied. So like oxygen always needs to be minus two if it's in a covalent bond with anything else. Um, and so if you can assign oxidation states to one side versus the other side, as soon as you can say, oh, that carbon is a minus three and over here it's a plus one, boom, redox reaction because the oxidation state changed, right? Even if it's not a full on combustion reaction. So if we wanted to, Do this one since it's sitting right here. If we're trying to figure out if this is a redox reaction or not, first off, okay, so what would be the most efficient way to figure out what type of reaction this is? Is water in it? There's water as a product. We start with something that we would name as an acid. We so start with an acid and we don't end with an acid. It's probably an acid base reaction. And so, but if we're trying to go through the process of assigning oxidation states to convince ourselves it's not a redox reaction, we can look at this and say, okay, well, I've got this nitric acid, which is really. <clears throat> Really, a nitrogen, three oxygens, and a hydrogen, right? And we can tell, I guess I'm not going to go off the structure right now. Um, so, what's, what's the oxygen's oxidation state in this case? Does it have to be, what's the charge on the oxygen going to be? If it's the most electronegative thing, yeah, two minus. Almost always, unless oxygen bound to itself, to another oxygen or to a fluorine, then oxygen is going to be a minus two. So if the oxygens are minus two, and there's three of them, we still have hydrogen and nitrogen to decide which of those is easier to figure out what it is. Why? We started with oxygen because it was the most electronegative, right? So we can go to the other end of the spectrum and say, well, hydrogen is the least electronegative. So it has the less, the least control of electrons. And hydrogen only has one electron it can give up, right? So hydrogen's got to be a plus one. So what's the what's the oxidation state on the nitrogen then? We need them to we need to add up to zero as our overall charge on the molecule is zero. It's got to be a plus five. So to see if the oxygens, if uh, the nitrogen changed, what's the oxidation state on the nitrogen over here? The oxygen still didn't change, right? There's still three of them. They're all minus two. What's the charge on the potassium? Nice. Potassium? Yeah. Plus one. This is in column one the periodic table, right? So when it's an ion, it's always plus one. So nitrogen is plus five again, right? And as a as a hint, for any polyatomic ions, nitrate always has the same oxidation states because nitrate always has the same charge and has the same formula, right? So if we can look at it over here and say, oh, well, my nitrogen's all in the form of nitrate, and it's still nitrate over here, the nitrogen did not get oxidized or reduced. Okay, so the nitrogen didn't change, the oxygen there didn't change. What's the oxidation state on this oxygen? Still the most electronegative, right? So it's still minus two. And how about here? Two. Still minus two. So none of our oxygens changed oxidative states. So the only options left are hydrogen and potassium. Did, what's the oxidation state on 
that hydrogen. It's still plus one, right? It's still part of hydroxide. It's still um, less electronegative than the oxygen. So it's a plus one. And what's the oxidation state on potassium? Still plus one, it's still potassium ion. So it's still a plus one, right? So potassium didn't change. Just to fully show our work here, hydrogen was plus one and plus one on that side, still plus one in water, right? There's two of them, and they're both less electronegative than oxygen. So by going through that whole process, that allows us to very definitively say with, without a shadow of a doubt, this is definitely not a redox reaction which means it's either a precipitation or an acid base as far as we're concerned at this point. Mm -hmm. Is it a precipitation reaction? No. So this is just as a way that you can, if you can't, don't look at that and recognize it as an acid base, you can still use process of elimination if you know what a precipitation looks like and you can do your oxidation states. Just by going through that. And as soon as you see that something changes, even if it doesn't look like a metal metal redox or it doesn't look like a combustion, but if you can look at it and say, um, this oxidation state changed, then it's got to be a redox reaction of some sort. And a full credit answer is if it doesn't fit into combustion and metal metal redox, you can still say it's a redox. I don't know what we would call it, but I know it's a redox reaction. It would still be a full credit answer. Okay, so oxidation states are your go to. Um, unless you can recognize when the other one's easier. So, a quick question. Yeah. Did you do any of that scale of the charges? I... Not, take John, not just to answer this question, and not if you can look at it and already recognize it's acid base. Like, we, the first thing we did is say, oh, well, that's an acid, and it's no longer an acid. It's almost certainly an acid base reaction. As soon as you can say that, you don't really need to do this. But this was just so we could practice and show, oh, yeah, definitely nothing's changing. We can conclusively say not only is the massive base, it's definitely not a redox. Can you like mix them up accidentally where it's similar to this, but it's, it is a redox? <clears throat> um, so the, if it's an acid base reaction, it's also a redox reaction, that means that there's really two things happening at once. And so sometimes we would write that as one reaction, but it's really two different things. And I would personally prefer to keep them as two separate reactions. It does this and then it goes and does that. So one example of that would be like um, acetic acid plus vinegar or plus baking soda. So sodium bicarbonate plus acetic acid, when they react together, the acetic acid acts as, as the acid, gives away the H plus to the hydrogen carbonate, and you get H2CO3 and sodium acetate. And then this, Carbonic acid does not exist very stably at high concentrations of water. So what happens then is this turns around and turns into an H2O and a CO2 mold. So a lot of times you see this reaction written, acetic acid plus sodium bicarbonate turns into sodium acetate and H2O in water, but it's really two different things happening. And it actually turns out neither of them is, is a redox reaction if you assign oxidation states to the carbons, even though the carbon is losing um, one of its oxygens, it's also losing those two hydrogens and it winds up the oxidation state on carbon is plus four in both cases. So the oxidation state, even though it looks like we're producing a gas um, and it looks like maybe there's an oxidation happening, it's not really happening. It, if we go through that process of assigning oxidation states. So, so to answer, long way of saying, yes, you can write a reaction that is combines multiple types of reactions, but really what you're doing is you're simplifying a multi-step process to just the final and the initial. Okay.
I had one question. So I was wondering about we have two reaction reactions happening like around the same time or sequentially. Is there can you combine reactions at all, or do they you can? So basically, if you have one, two reactions happen, like if we have a reaction happening sequentially like this, anything that's a, a if it's a product from the first reaction that then gets used up in the second reaction, when we add the reactions together, we end up with the same molecule that both of the reactants and products, which in, in these chemical reactions, when they balance, we can actually do a lot of the same stuff that we do with an algebraic equation. And so in algebra, if you get a plus X on one side and a plus X on the other side, you can subtract X from both sides and it goes away, right? We can do the same thing with the chemical. So if we were, if I was writing this reaction out, uh, both of these out in a more complete way, same gas it. Uh, AC with a negative one charge is the shorthand for acetate, just in the interest of saving this space here. And then we have carbonic acid turns into H2O plus water or plus CO2. If we added these together, we'd wind up with carbonic acid as a reactant and as a product, and we could just cancel it out. Um, and you actually will do that's actually probably the single trickiest. Thing that you will do next quarter is learning how to manipulate multiple reactions and add them up and uh, cancel out things the right way without messing with your balancing. Um, because it turns out you can do that also with their energies. If you can do it with their energies, you can also do it with their equilibrium constants, which you don't know what that is yet, but you will. Um, and so it's it's a really common trick, basically to write a multi-step process as one single action for the purposes of, well, all we really care about is writing certain degree. All right, so we're at 250. Let's, anybody who wants to keep reviewing, come back at three um, if you're ready to be done for, for the week and uh, gonna go work at, over the weekend and ask me questions next week. That's fine too, I won't be offended if nobody comes back after three. I'll be here until four if you have any more information. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. has two electrons. So, if, that's, if, if I wrote bromine is missing electrons, and bromine is missing electrons, then that would be wrong. Because zinc doesn't have as well. Zinc is really tight. Zinc is really So, if you just talk about zinc neutral and bromine neutral, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They both have electrons. Yeah, it's not bromine. Uh, 
Zinc becomes an ion by ditching its 4s electrons, and now all it has is the third energy. Yeah, totally. Got it. So this would be, you would take that answer now. The energy level, because there is an energy level. Yeah, so I would expect the would be larger because it has fewer protons for the same energy. Yeah, for sure. Okay. Well, I have one more. Oh, wait. It's fine. I have a compliment to do on your shirt, too, by the way. Yeah, I know. I, I, I used to live across the street from the, one of their locations. Nice. In, in Colorado. I love Me too. Me too. Uh, yes. <laughs> so it's the same one as available online. Yes. Yeah. Anybody else who did not get a Bruton take home test? They're up here. Um, I've got one more question. Jasper. Uh, well, my question is my main it. question. I know there's no sound in the video. It's like general tips. Yeah, yeah. so I'd love to. So a lot of times, if it's a chemical reaction, and then nerds and other things change when they're not. The best way to keep track of it is that ice stage. How much do you think? We touched on it the other day, but because that allows you to say, okay, all of these concentrations are changing. We don't have these ones are going to be going up twice as fast. And so, yeah. so keeping track of them, they have more than one thing, the concentration you care about, or your concentration. Yeah, this table is a really good way to organize your thoughts. Sometimes you want to have it. I didn't think it was not obvious right away. Oh, yeah, I have a question. So, I was talking to the accommodation. Okay. So, we're good there. So, schedule your desk over there. I'll make sure that they have a copy of it. Okay. I have a question about the class final. Is it going to be similar like the last one? Like, I mean, similar to the practice exam? Yeah. Okay. So, at most, we do things that we're going to be kind of. But now, let me pull up last year's. <laughs> so I think I did four matching a little bit because I spaced everything out for a more. And then I okay. was going to change all your numbers in place. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. That's what I'm going to do. I will pull up. Uh, yeah. I station that I see the same thing just all spread out a little more. So you don't have to spend that too. Um, yeah. I have like any that most there's things like I throw in a couple bones, or I might like, yeah. there might be something like what's I want to say what's the percentage right. what's you know what's the percentage um, like of this right direction. Like, I guess I can get to some labs. Okay. okay. So then, but for the most part, yeah, it's gonna look yeah. very very similar. To to the more you can take the, the written words into the chemical the more you can sort of see how things um, so that's happening. Uh, if there's a reaction happening, yeah. you're trying to figure out how many things. I'm just not going to use it. I'm the action that it has to balance. So you can make a bunch of things and react as well. And once you have that group, you know, it's, and then you can start saying, oh, it says I have this much on this one. That concentration. Then you can start putting it in. Okay, underneath this concentration. So, I would, yeah, the more you can put it into a form of birth. Um, yeah, I think it would come. The total mass is three grams, right? That means you can write three grams. Yeah, I would do the same. 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 Yeah, I would do the same.
So that one you can't add them together because they're they're both using up the same reactive organism of the oxygen. But we would, we would not generally add them up because in that case, that's implying that um, you can't burn the thing in the house. So you have to add it again. We don't think we're going to yeah. You can add them up as well. But if they're competing reactions, I would say, let's 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 see. See. Yeah. Uh, I just wanted to make this one thing we were doing on one of the ICA since we created like certain knowledge groups is it's like both of the results are the same, like with, with the water and the carbon yeah. dioxide. So you can do like a ratio of how much water and carbon dioxide they both produce, right? Yeah. Uh, and so, in, in general, things are going to be more useful to keep them as separate chemical reactions as much as you can. Yeah. You'll learn what it is. Yeah. We did never like the one where we, we combine them by saying, okay, well, I know that I'm making carbon dioxide. It's going to be one of the sources. Yeah. We didn't combine yeah. all the reactions. We just said like, all of my CO2 is either one or the reaction one. It looks like making a reaction. Yeah. Yeah. And so that's, that's where you combine things. As long as you can say that you know it's true, you can find the matter. And so if you only have two sources of carbon dioxide, you know that it's coming from the general direction and the other direction. That's what allows us to say we have CO2 equals these two things. It was like they were just doing it at different speeds. Well, like producing gas. So it's like yeah, and that that reaction actually is not a bad one to use. Um, an ice table for two things and more stuff. What was that day? Plant. But if I don't remember what it is, then yeah, that was yeah. That sounds so really yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, that's what he, yeah, that's what he gets. 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 Yeah, that's it's no second for that. I don't know what that is. So, is it Yeah. Yeah. Oh, it's kind of, yeah. It's kind of yeah. It's a little more like it. I'm up with my sleeve, right? Oh, I think it's great. Really? So, I'm sure something may have been I'm on large. So, I think it's at least two separate reactions. And you look at the piece table for each of them. Literally, on October 10th, this is sort of for 2E. We knew okay. that. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's like the Yeah, all right. It feels weird this one would be a plus x yeah. plus plus two x really and so at the end you're going to line up with zero so all we can do that uh, and yeah all the tips like you do the same thing over here plus you can you take the amount of your response why and then like we did all the options minus five and over here and starting with plus one hundred plus Exactly, but they would be like the people who are so so since they're making the same compound, you can say okay, our total moles of CO two is equal to x plus three y, and our total number is equal to two x plus four y. So that we're not combining the reactions so much as we're combining the products. Cool. Okay. Make more sense? Yeah, I was wondering where this came from. Yeah, yeah. and specifically, like I said, the ice tables look more complicated. It's more writing, takes up more space, but it does make it really obvious how these things are all related and that this X, that X, and that X are all the same because it's all the same reaction and these Ys are all the same. Yeah, yeah, yeah it makes sense. sense. Cool. Is that a good way to approach number 10? Yes, it's a great way to approach number 10. The difference with number 10 is that you have the reactions happening sequentially 
and you don't know that you have enough oxygen, right? And so you have reaction one happening, it uses up some of your oxygen. And then you have reaction two happening, uses up some of your oxygen, maybe the rest of your oxygen. Mm -hmm. But that does give you a way to say, okay, well, from reaction one, I made this many moles of CO2 and this many moles of water, and I used this much oxygen. And then in reaction two, I started with this many moles of uh, ethanol, I think is the other one, right? Mm -hmm. This many moles of ethanol, this many moles of oxygen, minus X, and fill this in. Say, okay, well, my oxygen's running out first, so I'm going to have a few moles of uh, ethanol left over, and I'm making more CO2 and water. And then that gives, allows you to say, okay, well, my total moles of CO2 at the end is the CO2 I made here plus the CO2 that I made there. My total moles of oxygen at the end might be zero, or you might have a little bit left over, depending on what happens. Mm -hmm. But yes, yeah, it's, it's just a way of organizing things so you don't lose yourself in the weeds because there's so many things changing. So when reactions are happening uh, sequentially, it means to completion, like the first butane yeah, at this point. goes to completion, and then the second reaction happens. Next quarter, you'll add in, you have two competing reactions, and neither one of them goes to completion, but they interact with each other because they both have the same <laughs> reactant, and that's gonna affect, they wind up affecting each other because if, if reaction uses a little bit more of the water reactant, and then the other one that changes the ratio that this reaction happens, they wind up getting tied together, and that's when you need to add your reactions together. That's like where they go in both directions, right? Right. And then they reach an equilibrium. Yeah, so equilibrium just means that no reactions ever stop reacting. They, are, they just get to a point where they're happening forward at the same rate that they're happening backward. So things are still changing. And so that's what we call equilibrium, is when you get that. It's called dynamic equilibrium. Because things are still changing, they're just there's no net change because they're making product as fast as it's using product, and so that's when you can mathematically ice tables wind up being really useful for that because you don't know that anything is ending at zero. You just know that it's some amount of what you started with is being used up, and that winds up being really interesting algebra problems um, where you almost need the ice tables to keep track of things. Awesome. If this was H2O, it would be 2x was still that, right? Yeah, so moles of H2O, the way we have it written here. So 2x comes from the first reaction, and then we get a 4y from the second reaction. Is x and y like the number of moles of those two? or So x and y are, in this case, with these ice tables, we basically treat it like it's how many times the reaction happens. So that means that anything that has a coefficient of one, if the reaction happens once, you use one molecule of methane, right? But anytime you have a coefficient of two, if this reaction happens once, you make two of those. So X is, you can think of the X and the Y in, in the change row of the ice tables, how many times the reaction happens. But when you substitute X and Y for numbers, it would usually, because it's like you have your limiting reaction, you know how many moles of CO2 you have on one reaction and the other, and you plug that Yeah, let's say if this was 1.5 moles instead of just X. But if we know we're ending with zero moles of methane at the end, then we can figure out X by just saying, well, X has got to be 1.5, right? If this was not a coefficient of one, let's say we, we uh, change this and we say, okay, let's say we have, 1.0 moles of oxygen initially. Oxygen's being used up, so it's minus twice as fast. So if oxygen is our limiting reactant, oxygen is the one that's ending at zero, not methane. And so in this case, you wind up, okay, well, X winds up being 0.5, right? Which means we can fill in over here. These okay, I'm gonna make 0.5 moles here. I'm gonna use 0.5 moles of my methane. I'm gonna make 0.5 times two moles of water. So it's it's basically just a way of keeping track of, of the stoichiometry using x and y's rather than just setting it up like a conversion. It's the same AC idea. You use the pluses and minuses to indicate you're using something up or making it. And they use the coefficients, say how much relative to one reaction happening. 
I realize I'm still recording. <laughs> I'm not sure how much of this would be useful. I, or or you necessarily want to watch. Okay, so I'll keep recording for a few minutes as long as I'm using the smart board. All right. I haven't heard a question from you since the very first one. So I'm going to go to you next if you have anything in particular. Two very quick ones. Okay. So one is just oxidizing and introduction. When something's oxidized, it gains electrons. So that makes something uh, when something's oxidized, it loses electrons. Okay. So we're in the oil ring or Leo says burn. Oxidized, so it right, so loses electrons. Right. And it makes that a use of agent. Correct. Because if it loses electrons, something else has to take those electrons, right? So if something is trying to become oxidized, it's going to force some, whatever it's with to take the electrons. So it's a reducing agent because whatever you put with it gets reduced. And then if it's like in a chemical reaction, you find which ones actually change, and the ones that don't change at all, you don't care about in that sense. Right. But whatever is oxidized loses electrons, which makes it a reducing yeah. agent. Yeah. Opposites treat the other. Yeah. Okay. And other quick thing, um, the molecular geometry is the hyper hybridization. Mm -hmm. Just a quick. So if I looked at that, would that be an S D? Correct hybridization. You need as many hybridized orbitals as you have electron numbers. So electron domains. Go back to the way we described it back in the lab, right? So how do we so cyanic acid has two electron groups around the carbon, two domains taking up space, so it needs two hybridized orbitals. You just start from the lowest energy and you add them until you get to the right number of orbitals. So you only need two orbitals. So you start with an S and you add one pair of P to it. But if it was a lone pair there, that would be SP2. Correct. So, so if we had something that now we look at such a molecular molecular geometry is nothing you do technically with hyper Yeah, electron so geometry is a direct correlation, it's one to one. It's hybridization is basically another way of saying electron geometry in fewer syllables. Okay. Um, but molecular geometry is what takes into account the fact you can't see the bone pairs. And so this one, hybridization would be sp2. It's got three electron groups taking up space. So you need three hybridized orbitals. Lowest energy, next lowest energy, and you need three orbitals of that next lowest. And if you ever run out of the orbitals and you still need more, you start mixing the d orbitals after that. You don't use the d orbitals until you run out of the orbitals. The p orbitals are lower in energy. The bonds are sigma, pi, and this bond's what? Really, sigma bonds and pi bonds. A triple bond is, is two pi bonds. Okay. There's no name for that third one? No, it's it's considered a second pi bond. Okay. If we looked at this, we'd say that between the carbon and the nitrogen, there's one sigma and two pi bonds. I thought it was like maybe a new bond or something. Like that might you if you could make a quadruple bond, which are still just hypothesized. There's there's been some studies that say that this exists, but it's still like on the frontiers of uh, chemistry research. Then you would bring in another bond type. If you have d orbitals that have to overlap with each other to make a quadruple bond, because you can't make a quadruple bond out of three p bonds. Because then that third, that fourth bond can't be in the same spot as the first two pi bonds. So you would have to go to a next energy level or the next orbital type. And so if you did that, you could conceivably have another, which might be a mu bond. I don't remember what they call it, but that's as good as I guess as anything um, off the top of my head. So if you've seen that, that's probably what it was. But that's only when you get to the quadruple level. Yeah, that's pretty, it's pretty out there. Really rare. You really only see that. The only thing that I've seen is if you have transition metals bonded to each other and then surrounded and stabilized by a bunch of organic, a bunch of carbons and the layers. And you can, I think I was, it was two molybdenums. I remember a paper that I saw on this a while ago. Um, two molybdenums surrounded by a bunch of nitrogens and carbons are able to make. <laughs> One sigma, two piles, and then a new. Maybe not something about sigma pylons. Maybe 
Not if I do add something like that, in there, yeah. um, it would be either a bonus point or maybe like one point out of 10 on one of those sections. Okay, okay. so it won't be a significant chunk. Okay. Um, we just haven't spent that much time. You'll spend a lot of time in that and okay. Mm -hmm. Because sigma bonds and pi bonds react very differently. Mm -hmm. And like the strength of them. And it's their relative strength, what they react with, how they're stabilized, all those things change if it's a sigma bond versus a pi bond. And so we talk a lot about it qualitatively in organic chemistry. Mm -hmm. Um, but so I'm just sort of laying frame. Yeah. 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 You good, Jasper? Yeah, good. I was kind of seeing something else that came up. Yeah. Uh, I was confused about mm -hmm. how you got on the remote, how you went from milliliters of H2 to grams. <laughs> but I didn't mention that it's weirder than that. Um, so, so there are really either you would either take 500 milliliters of water since the total volume is going to be 500 milliliters mm -hmm. since we had some water molecules that we had the 50 mils here you could add those 50 mils to the 450 and get a total of 500 okay but if you just looked at it like this and like treat that like it's one reactant and treat that like it's the other reactant mm -hmm. um we just try to get everything into grams or to moles first Okay. And figure out what's getting used up and what is left over. Because you went to grams right here, and I don't, I don't understand that conversion. So because it's, it's not a solution, it's a pure substance. Mm -hmm. But we don't measure water in grams typically, right? If we're measuring yeah. out an amount of water, it's usually in a volume, mm -hmm. like 450 milliliters. Yeah. So if you have 450 milliliters, that's not enough to get to a moles on its own. Yeah. But if we can get from milliliters to grams by just using the density, um, since the density of water is one milliliter, so it. that's what that step is. One milliliter is 0.9970. Got it. Use the density to get into grams. And then we that makes sense. Great. I just made an assumption that um, because I just did the molarity out of like, oh, and then also you stayed in milliliters instead of liters. Wait. Oh, I, that's just a. Tablet. Oh, there it is. Okay. That should be ten to the third milliliters. Okay. So I just I combined. You did a step later. Um. Well, and, and I I combined two conversions at once. Milliliters instead of saying ten to the third milliliters is one liter, uh -huh. and then one liter is whatever the concentration is in moles. I just combine those and said 10 to the third milliliters is that many moles. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That makes so makes sense. Combining those two. Perfect. I was confused on how to get to um, moles of water with yeah. just milliliters. So if it's a if it's if you have a volume of a pure substance mm -hmm. and you need to get to moles, usually that means using the density because you've got to get to grams. And once you have grams, you can use the molecular weight. Okay. Great. But more, a more likely version of that problem that might show up on the test would be something more like this. Yeah, I think that's or a good water problem. is not a reactant. Um, because this, if you do it this way, then you wind up with, like, with these moles being relatively close to each other and then smaller amount of excess left over, and you can divide by the total volume at the end. This would be more what that problem was supposed to be. Perfect, and that one is in grams, and I can get to moles of that. That makes exactly. sense. Um, do you you don't have the answer to that? Do you? Um, no. No, do that do you, want, do you want to do it? No, no, I'm sure. If you have time, I mean, I'm here to practice. You got half an hour. Just, uh, do you want to take take a couple minutes and try it on your own first? Sure. Yeah. Let's do that. Thanks, Sean. No problem.